one of the 20th, uh, one of 20th century humorists, Irma Bombeck's favorite stories was about the grandmother who took her grandson to the beach one day, complete with bucket, shovel, and sun hat. The grandmother dozed off and as she slept, a large wave dragged the child out to sea. The grandmother awoke and was devastated. She fell to the ground on her knees and prayed, God, if you save my grandchild, I promise I'll make it up to you. I'll join whatever club you want me to. I'll volunteer at the hospital, give money to the poor and do anything that makes you happy. Suddenly, a huge wave tossed her grandson back on the beach, right at her feet. She noticed color in his cheeks and his eyes were bright. He was alive, all was well. However, as she stood up, she seemed to be upset. Putting her hands on her hips, she looked skyward and said, you know, I can identify with that grandmother. How often in life do we receive a blessing only to miss it or whine because the outcome isn't exactly what we had hoped for or looks or feels different than what we expected? How many times have we discovered God doing for us what we could not do for ourselves and seen it as a problem rather than a gift? How many times have we missed the blessing altogether because we just did not have the eyes to see the grace of God. This story about Jesus healing 10 men with a skin disease, a story found only in the gospel according to Luke, is more often than not used to preach and teach us about giving thanks. In fact, the lectionary assigns it on Thanksgiving day in year A, and it often falls at about the time of the Canadian day for Thanksgiving in year C. Now, it's no wonder that Thanksgiving is preached from this text. On his way to Jerusalem, Jesus is approached by 10 people with skin diseases. The, the disease made them ritually unclean, which meant that they couldn't participate in the temple services and rituals that were at the center of their faith. Unable to practice their faith, these people stood outside of the community, alone, abandoned, desperate even. When they realize that Jesus is coming near them, they call out, not simply for comfort or companionship or someone to listen to them, but instead pleading for mercy on them and asking for a cure. The text notes, by the way, that as they cry out, they keep their distance, for society's rules have been ingrained into them, and they act accordingly. Now, as he's apt to do, Jesus hears the pleas for mercy. He commands them to present themselves before the priests in order to be restored to the communities from which their diseases have cast them. These people must be declared free of any infliction by a priest. So they abide and are healed as they go. They go and seek restoration. True to form, Luke gives us another story. We've heard so many of them this season about an outsider being called in, a marginalized person being brought to the center of the community, the unclean being made clean by the movement of God's love. But the story goes on. One of the healed returns to Jesus. He praises God, then prostrates himself at Jesus' feet, and he gives thanks. Now, I don't know about you, but I have heard and maybe even preached more than my share of sermons on this text, and most of them wagged the proverbial preacher's finger at the nine for dissing Jesus, not saying thank you, and heading off without a backwards glance to see the priest to be restored to their community which, by the way, is exactly what Jesus told them to do. And that same preacher probably celebrated the actions of the one Samaritan, praising his praise, highlighting his humility, and gushing all over the gratitude that he gave to Jesus in response to his healing. But something doesn't feel quite right for me with this reading of the text. It's kind of like when your mother tells you to say thank you when you forget. You look at your Aunt Sadie and eke out a disingenuous thank you for the ugly sweater she gave you at Christmas because you're supposed to. 
not only does the thank you land like a lead balloon in the room, but everybody is kind of embarrassed and you aren't feeling grateful at all. And you kind of hate the ugly sweater and wish she had gotten you a gift card. I mean, all of these things that creatures preach are true. The one dude did turn around and praise God for the healing, dropped to his knees in humble thanksgiving and saw that a miracle had happened for him. And that's good spiritual stuff. It is surely true that living a life of thankfulness leaves little room for discouragement. In fact, there's an old legend of a man who found the barn where Satan keeps his seeds ready to be sown in the human heart. On finding the seeds of discouragement more numerous than others, the man learned that those seeds could be made to grow almost anywhere. Seeds of discouragement. When Satan was questioned, he reluctantly admit, admitted that there was one place in which he could never get those seeds of discouragement to thrive. And where is that? Asked the man. Satan replied sadly, in the heart of a grateful soul. Research has shown that people who count their blessings find themselves sleeping better, exercising more, and caring more about others. People who remind themselves of the things that they're grateful for, people who count their blessings one by one consciously every day, show significant improvements in mental, spiritual, and physical health. And this is true whether you are a healthy college student or an older person with an incurable disease. So it's no wonder that we write gratitude lists and find best-selling books, internet crashing memes, and spirituality workshops galore on the topic and practice of gratitude. Both science and our experience tells us that an attitude of gratitude is a very good thing. But is that it? Is that all there is to this story? Handwrite your thank you notes. Oh my God, I'm doomed. Uh, Mom, I see you there. I, I, I just, it's like the worst thing on the planet. Handwrite your, your thank you notes. Tell, tell wait staff and family members alike that uh, thanks when they do something nice and count your blessings because it reduces your stress, because you're supposed to, because it keeps you from feeling guilty. Nah, that's not it. Because it's not only that the guy turned around and said thanks, it's also about the way it happened. You see, he wasn't only saying thanks for the cleansing of a skin disease. He noticed where it came from and who was doing the healing. And so he was compelled. Restoration to his community, returning to his lover, his kids, his temple, meeting up with that priest and no longer being treated like, well, a leper. It was all there for the taking, but he could not help himself. He had to turn back to praise God and fall to his knees in humble gratitude. That sounds pretty authentic. I mean, it wasn't an ugly sweater and he knew it. All 10 were made well. All 10 did just what they were told. They headed to the priests as Jesus commanded, and along the way, they were made well. But one, one noticed. And seeing what had happened, he turned back to give thanks. He simply could not continue without offering praise and gratitude. Theologian David Lowe says that noticing Seeing grace does that to us. It draws you beyond the confines of your usual and normal preoccupations and lifts you outward, eager to connect with others, glad to offer thanks. The one Samaritan noticed grace and was lifted, compelled outward from himself to connect with Jesus and offer thanks. And everything changed for him. And beloved Jesus sees that. He knows that this is so, which is why he says what may be the weirdest line in the story, this last word, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. So wait, is he not already well? He followed the treatment plan, and the text tells us that all 10 were healed of the skin disease. But Jesus says, your faith 
That is the act of noticing and responding to grace has made you well. I think that bears repeating. Your faith, the act of noticing and responding to grace has made you well. So what is Jesus up to here with this last word? Well, as it turns out, the word sozo, the Greek word, can indeed be translated as made well in the sense of being healed. But it can also be translated as saved, which we heard in the translation that we chose to uh, have Liz read. Saved in the sense of being brought through mortal danger. And it can be translated, and this is my favorite, as made whole in the sense of being completed and made to be what you were meant to be all along. So you see, 10 were indeed made clean, but only one was saved. 10 were healed, but only one was made whole. 10 were cured of more than a skin disease, but only one recognized it and gave thanks, and in giving thanks became what God had intended all along connected to the healer. There was a gift far greater than the gift of physical healing for the one who came back. You see, in the turning back, the one who was made whole turned to the relationship between himself and Jesus. You see, if it's only about the recovery from the disease, and if we're only noticing what God does for us, then we have missed the point. Besides noticing the healing uh, uh, besides noticing the healing, the grace, the one who turned back noticed the grace and was compelled to praise the grace and connect with the one who offered that amazing grace. Biblical scholar Leander Keck wrote that authentic praise of God acknowledges what is true about God. It responds to qualities that are there and not simply there for me. In other words, God is to be praised because God is God, because of what God is and does, quite apart from what God is and does for me. Anyone can and should praise God when the Lord blesses one and keeps one, and gratitude is indeed often expressed as praise and rightly, but that does not make praise and gratitude identical. And you see, here is a rub. God does not cease to be praiseworthy when we aren't feeling the love, when gratitude has fled because we think that the Lord is withholding blessings, or when things aren't lining up the way we think they should be. God does not cease to be praiseworthy when we think that the divine face has disappeared or is set against us, or when agony drives out peace. God does not cease to be praiseworthy when we're sick or suffering or lonely or grieving. God does not cease to be praiseworthy in a pandemic or when our kid is thrown back on the sand without his, his hat. God is to be praised because God is God and is standing there showing us mercy and just waiting for us to turn back and say, thank you, so that God can say, go for your faith. And this relationship has saved you, made you well, and made you whole. It is that relationship grounded in gratitude itself that is the secret to all the good stuff. Noticing grace around you, seeing goodness in the world, paying attention to healing in all of its forms, stopping to take in the blessings that abound in our lives, and then giving thanks for the ordinary and extraordinary graces of our life together, this is the secret to a good life and the heart of a faith that makes us whole, no matter what is happening around us. Jesus's point in those last words to the one who turned back was this, your faith has given you a new life with me. 
Your faith has saved you from the ordinary and humdrum and the mundane and perhaps even the mortal and ushered you into a realm of grace and gratitude. And because of that, we get to turn around, praise God, and share the good news of this secret with others. So that was the last word of this pericope. Maybe Jesus' last word for this sermon is this. I am going to Jerusalem to heal you all. Will you turn to me so that I might tell you the secret? Listen. Your faith has given you the greatest blessing of all. An always amazing, grace-based relationship with a God who loves you and is with you no matter what. A grace-based relationship with the one to whom you belong. A grace-based relationship that is mysterious and wonderful and curious and hard but it is a grace-based relationship that will ground you in gratitude if you stop and notice the grace and praise God. It is a grace-based relationship that will nourish the growth of your heart and soul if you exercise it. It is a grace-based relationship that will compel you to serve and seek justice if you turn from the self and seek my will it is a grace-based relationship that will inspire you to be of use for God's kingdom and spread love extravagantly in my name. So go, beloved, in grace and gratitude and be a blessing for your faith has saved you and made you whole. May it be so.